So with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Filippo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you guys for coming. I'll, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the research that is going on in our, in our lab on the spread of misinformation in social media. And I want to say at the outset that this is work by a lot of people, colleagues and postdocs and graduate students, some of whom are in the audience. Like some of the work here was done with Diego, who's now working here. And so we'll have uh, their names at the end, but just please consider this is not my work. This is the work of our entire group. And, uh, and I hope that you'll find it interesting. So let me start with a movie of Marvin. Marvin is a, a cute character there. There, And it was, a, um, this was a funny picture during the Mars uh, landing. And so it went viral, uh, not surprisingly. And so this is just a nice visualization of a piece of a meme, a picture in this case, that uh, goes viral on a social network. It's really pretty. We could see these patterns of diffusion. We could see clusters, the role of communities and clusters. In the, in the spreading of viral information, we can see the bursty nature of the spread, like in this case, where it seems that the meme has penetrated a new community and then it spreads very fast inside that community. And then it takes some time to, for it to go from, you know, from one community to, to the next. And these are beautiful patterns and there's a lot of work studying these kind of diffusion dynamics in, in social media. And unfortunately, however, not all that goes viral is pretty pictures and interesting things. There's a lot of junk and misinformation out there. Here's three examples of things that you might find today on Twitter. Uh, Obama is a Muslim, vaccines cause autism, and there's these people at Indiana University who are wasting federal funds to suspend conservative accounts. Yes, that's us. So I'll tell you a lot more about that. Um, and so uh, it's interesting to try and understand what are the factors that make misinformation uh, persistent and sometimes, unfortunately, viral. And the sad news is that if you look at some data, we are, this is based on some data that we got from the emergent.info website, uh, which for a, for a period of time has tracked uh, hoaxes uh, from from um, any sorts of uh, news organizations that were being spread and shared on social media. And if you look at the distribution of popularity, how many people are resharing and retweeting uh, this stuff, it, it looks very much the same. It has the traditional characteristic familiar signatures of, of, uh, uh, of popularity, which is a scale, more or less scale for your broad distribution. And really you cannot distinguish between articles that are promoting accurate information and, this, and the sharing of articles that are promoting misinformation. For example, those that are supporting hoaxes or those that are saying that reliable information is in fact a hoax. And we all see examples of those, including in the debates, right? Uh, so, 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 so this seems kind of worrying and, and it's good to understand the causes. And a few years ago, we started seeing the effects of this kind of stuff in politics. So some colleagues studied back in 2010 an example of a coordinated uh, attack by a bunch of social Twitter bots that was able to put some misinformation in the front page of search results when people search for the name of a candidate in a major elections. This was Massachusetts, Massachusetts special elections a few years ago. They called it a Twitter bomb. So, in fact, the spread of misinformation can have huge effects in politics. And uh, this, uh, this has been an interesting trend that has been studying for a few years ago. This is from several years ago where, um, where we started studying this. Uh, very recently, there was this cover uh, of Business Week in which a, a guy uh, tells his story about how he's been able to manipulate the outcomes of several elections in Central and South America over a period of several years. Um, and you might think that he's making it, this up, except that he's been collaborating with authorities. He's in jail in exchange for a shorten shortening of his sentence to 10 years. Um, he's been providing a lot of information about his techniques, and so a lot of it has been verified. So it's, it's incredibly scary. Is this happening also in the United States? The answer is we don't know, and that's what's so scary. Um, 
So I'll tell you a, a little bit of uh, a, a research in, in, in three different directions. One is uh, machine learning methods to detect uh, misinformation online. And then I'll talk a little bit about some models to understand the diffusion of misinformation. And finally, some things that perhaps can be done to mitigate this problem. So we see pictures like this, uh, which are diffusion networks uh, where nodes represent people, in this case on Twitter, and edges represent a meme, a piece of information. It could be a URL, a link to a news articles, it could be a picture, uh, a username, or a, a phrase, or a hashtag going from a person to another person. And blue uh, indicates a retweet, and orange represents a mention. So when you know, when you retweet someone else, then that shows that that piece of information has gone from that person to you. And likewise, if you mention someone, then that person knows that you've uh, said something about them. So uh, this is a typical picture that you would see when you look at the diffusion of political content in the US, where you have two big clusters. Uh, one might represent the conservatives, one might represent the liberals, and there is not much retweeting between them. So we started seeing these patterns a few years ago, and we started asking the question, does the structure of the network, of the diffusion network, tell us something about the quality or of the, of the information that is being spread? So you see pictures like the one I showed you at the top, in many cases of grassroots spread, where people are really you know, talking about stuff. But then you also see some pathological examples uh, like these, uh, which represent not humans, but software, bots, accounts controlled uh, by, uh, by some entity in order to achieve some outcome. Okay, so maybe somebody's trying to promote a candidate, or maybe somebody's trying to have a smear campaign against the candidate, or maybe somebody's trying to make it look like somebody's uh, trending on Twitter, or maybe somebody's making it look like somebody has lots of followers or lots of likes. And you can do these things very easily with scripts uh, so that whether maybe you can have a bot that actually create content but you don't even have to be that sophisticated you can just create or buy lots and lots of accounts and just have them all controlled by a single individual so the content is human created but it gives the impression that there is a lot of people out there saying something where in fact it's just one person or one entity uh, creating that appearance so here for example we have a case of two accounts that uh, that were bots that were simply doing something very simple. They were generating tens of thousands of tweets, all promoting a particular candidate. This was happening in the 2010 elections. That candidate uh, went on to be a very powerful person. And uh, so this would be the account of that candidate. So one of the account was mentioning that candidate. That's, you see the orange edge. But then the two candidates were retweeting each other, literally tens of thousands of times a day. And so that had the effect of making that candidate trend on Twitter. And I remember watching the news hour one night and they were saying, this person is very popular on social media. It is trending today. And so, um, so that's an example of ways in which with very, very, very simple few lines of code, you can have a big effect in determining what people see, what information they're exposed to. And this might affect, um, the opinions that they form, how they vote perhaps, and maybe policies. And sometimes we see slightly more sophisticated cases. So in this case here, this was a bunch of bots that were coordinating to promote links to, fake, to a fake news website. It turned out that the person controlling these bots was also the person who uh, maintained that website. And he would create completely fabricated fake news, like Luis Amaral, uh, uh, spent five years in, in, in prison for child molestation. Okay, completely fabricated. <laughs> and then they would, they, would, they would have the link to that piece of fake news, and they would all, uh, more or less at the same time, mention an influential journalist, okay? A person with many, many followers. And all saying, oh, have you read this? Or check this out, or just the link to the article. And they were hoping that this person would believe it because this person would think that this was coming from many different people. And we now understand this, some people call this complex contagion. If you see something as coming from multiple people, you're more likely to believe it because you think that there's you know, a multitude of, of, um, of independent judgments as to the importance of the reliability of that piece of information. 
and we are followers and we are copiers and we're social animals so we follow the crowd and we go we can't can you resist watching a video when you know that it has 100 million views on youtube you cannot resist right okay so this is the same thing and occasionally somebody would retweet it and then it would create a big cascade and uh, and by the way, Twitter had some simple anti-spam measures so that they wouldn't recognize uh, bots if they were all at the same time posting the same link. So they were smart enough, they used a shortener like bit.ly, a URL shortener, and then they would add some random characters at the end because it turns out that bit.ly would ignore those random characters at the end. So Twitter would think that they were different links. And so these are simple ways in which you can literally, with a few lines of code, have, have a big effect. Apologies, Luis. That was for the recording. <laughs> that If you just tuned in, that was fabricated, totally made up. OK. <laughs> OK, so I guess that you buy the argument that misinformation can have bad consequences. So I've made my point. Um, so at that point, we, the first question that we were studying is like, can we just look at the structure of the network and, and distinguish between these two kinds of things, grassroots and astroturf. Astroturf is fake grassroots. And so we just built a standard off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm and we threw at it all kind of network structure uh, parameters. Things like you know, number of connected components, average of the degree distribution and modes and variants and and uh, you know, clustering coefficient and diameter, whatever you want. And it turns out that that was very accurate. Uh, we could, at that time, pretty much distinguish between these kind of uh, dynamics and, and with, with pretty good accuracy. So later on, we started asking the question, not just about the information, whether it was being propagated by artificial means, but the accounts themselves. Could we distinguish between an account run by a, a real person and an account controlled by, by a bot. And we've seen lots of examples of bots in social media, right? So uh, they are used to, for scams, they're used to create the appearance of fake followers, they're used to manipulate the stock market. Uh, there's been some pretty famous cases. And they are also used to get you to give your credit card if you're horny enough. And so, so some, some, by the way, many bots are harmless, right? We use them to tell us about the news and the weather, but some of them can, can uh, be used to deceive. And so that's why we, we want to ask the question, can we, can we detect them if they don't tell us that they're bots, you know, if they really want to appear like a human. So we build this uh, uh, system called bot or not, and you can play with it if you want. Uh, basically, you give it a, a Twitter handle, and it will uh, use the Twitter API to download uh, some data from Twitter about that account and its friends and followers. And then it will use a machine learning algorithm, but in this case, using a lot of features, not just network structural features, but uh, lots of other types of features. Uh, and then come up with some kind of scores that tells us you know, that this account, this is another former, former postdoc from our lab, is really a human, whereas this account that was actually a bot built for a class uh, where the students were uh, building bots for assignments, uh, you know, is really a bot. So, this is also has some uh, pretty accurate um, uh, accuracy, but very good, pretty good accuracy, although it is not foolproof, uh, obviously. And uh, we have uh, lots of different classes of features. I don't have time to go into all of them, it's over a thousand, but some of them look, for example, at temporal dynamics, you know, like are, is this account posting, you know, at regular interval every five minutes or during day and night, things of that sort that look more bot-like or is it like more bursty like a human? Uh, you can look at user metadata. Was this account created recently? Does it have a long name with lots of digits in it? Things of that sort. And also things more sophisticated like, uh, you know, look at the network of uh, retweets and mentions of this user and its followers or look at the hashtags that co-occur with the hashtags used by this account and see and look at the network structure of those. and and some sentiment analysis and some content analysis and so on. So we actually provide some visualizations for some of these things. Like here you can see the network hashtag graph and then we could do some simple analysis of, of, of that network or we could look at some sentiment uh, variables and uh, part of speech analysis and, and so on. 
So for example, you'll find that bots tend to uh, retweet more, they tend to be more recently generated, they may tweet less compared to the number of retweets, they may have longer usernames, that kind of thing. And if you put enough of these features together, you get a, a reasonable accuracy. So this was on the cover of CACM just a couple of months ago. And we use some of those lessons to, uh, when we participated in a competition organized by DARPA, uh, to see if different teams could detect bots uh, in, from Twitter, and so this was a this was a, there was somebody who was hired to um, to inject some actual bot content, and we saw it replayed as if it was real. So we couldn't really interact with the actual um, uh, you know with the actual Twitter, but and then the question is, could we detect these bots that were trying to influence uh, opinions? This was in their in the domain of uh, the anti-vax movement. And we had some good results there. That was also on the cover of I IEEE Computer. Another related problem is, can we detect whether something is being promoted by artificial means? Okay, so let's say that you see something trending on Twitter. Here's some examples of things that are trending on Twitter. And Twitter tells you if some of these were, uh, were promoted by advertising. But if you didn't know, would we be able to distinguish between things that are trending organically and things that are trending because somebody paid to put it in front of your eyeballs? And so in this particular example here, it turns out that that first hashtag was being promoted. And so we use that data hiding from the machine learning algorithm the fact that this was promoted to see if we could uh, uh, distinguish between these classes. And it's not trivial. For example, if you just look at volume, you could find things that are promoted and things that are organic that look that have very similar profiles. Um, um, so it's it's not really a trivial problem. Also, if you want to detect it very early, even before it goes trending, there's very little data. So that's even harder. It's a little bit easier later because after it goes trending, there's a lot of data. So you can see some of these network patterns. But nevertheless, uh, it turns out that uh, if you take into account not only you know, a fairly good number of uh, relevant features, but also the fact that uh, the dynamics of these features, if you treat each feature like a time series and you pay some attention to the, to the sequence uh, over time of the values of these features, then you, and that's what we do in, in these algorithms here that do pretty well in terms of accuracy, and by the way, we plot that as a function of delay. So here we're trying to detect before the trending point, and here we're trying to detect after the trending point. So that's why you see generally that the accuracy gets better after we have more data. And algorithms like uh, dynamic time warming, warping uh, tend to do relatively well because they try to capture whether each feature is, you know, is going up or down over time. They try to look at the shape of the, of the time series, as opposed to something that doesn't pay any attention to temporal changes of the feature values, um, which cannot do better than random, like random forest here. Okay, so uh, uh, we try to uh, build a platform that would make it a little bit easier for the general public, for journalists, for social scientists, to do some analysis with the data that we have collected from Twitter over time, because uh, Twitter has been very generous in granting access to some uh, to uh, uh, a, sam a large sample of tweets. So we build a system that we call the Observatory on Social Media, and the shortened version is awesome because this is awesome. And uh, and uh, oops, what happened there? Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. So you get the live demo. Let's see if I can get back to where I was. Okay. So uh, yeah, there is a URL there if you want to visit yourself. And on the awesome website, you'll see a bunch of tools like Bot or Not that I just told you about. We also have uh, we have tools for looking at trends over time, generating some movies of the uh, hashtag concurrence networks or the re or the retweet networks. Um, some maps, uh, and there is also an API, uh, so everybody can, can get this data. So here's an example of the timeline uh, tool, where you can compare popularity over time of different hashtags. Uh, you can provide a hashtag and a period of time and generate a movie that gets updated to YouTube, 
and and look at over time how, for example, a hashtag is co-occurring with co-occurring with other hashtags. This is this example here. Um, you can also get interactive visualizations of the diffusion networks. Uh, so here is ice bucket challenge is the hashtag. And then you can look at, in a particular period of time, who was retweeting whom, who was mentioning whom, and you can find some influential users and how they were connected. So here you see some people like Jimmy Fallon and a bunch of, I think, NFL uh, team accounts. You could see Katy Perry and, and so on. So you can explore these over time and, and try to get a sense about how some things are, are going viral. Uh, as I mentioned, you could get some maps. So here is a map of snow on a particular day where there was a snowstorm. And so you can track that. Um, so this uh, observatory, I won't go into technical details, but as I mentioned, the data comes from Twitter and we put it on a large cluster uh, where we try to store all this data so that you can look at uh, historical analysis. And we have these applications that I mentioned earlier. And we also have an API so this is really open to, to anybody. And one of the cool things that you can do with this API is that actually, remember I told you about Butternut. Butternut also has an API. So you can mash these things together. For example, you could say, well, um, who's talking about a particular hashtag in a particular period of time? SB277 is a hashtag to talk about a law that, was being that has been discussed for a while in California about exemptions to vaccinations. You know, like, uh, are parents allowed to, ex to not vaccinate their children? And what do they need to do in order to get that exemption if they wish? So there's a lot of debate here between those who uh, think that, you know, parents should not be forced to vaccinate their children and people who feel like, yes, they should be forced because by not vaccinating, you're putting other children at risk. So there's this debate going on. And uh, you, can, you can use Awesome to get that network and figure out who are the influential accounts and who's, you know, who's responsible for spread of this kind of meme. And then you can pass that through bot or not and say, are there some bots that are affecting this conversation? And so you can get a picture like this where, again, the nodes are the accounts. And here we color them based on the bot score. We color the, yeah, the nodes based on their bot score. And so you could see that there are some pretty influential accounts that here influence is measured as number of times that an account gets retweeted. And the size of the node represents that influence. And so you could see that there are some big nodes, influential accounts that, are, that have a color that indicates that they're almost surely bots. So that kind of a visualization of, of how bots can be used to affect perhaps manipulate, we don't know, but certainly to affect um, the conversation. So is it the case that people get exposed to information that they wouldn't without the bots? And are they aware that they are talking to a bot or, uh, or not? And how does this affect their opinions? And uh, it's an interesting question. We did exactly the same analysis for a few other hashtags. This is Brexit. And it was reported in the press uh, by other people that bots had a played an important role, so we tried to do the same analysis, and in fact, we found several very highly influential accounts that seem to be bots. And uh, we, of course, couldn't help ourselves uh, trying to use the two hashtags for the current uh, major uh, presidential candidates, and we could see that there are some bots there too, and actually on both sides. Um, in fact, uh, aside from the observation that you see some large uh, uh, red circles representing, in this case, uh, influential bot accounts on both sides, you also see a little bit of the different structure here. You see, for example, in this case of I'm with her, you see two different uh, communities. And so probably the majority of, in this case, are supporters, but you also have people who try to participate in that conversation by using that hashtag, probably presenting a different, a different view. So that's one of the interesting dynamics that we observe. OK, so this is uh, some examples of the things that we could do to try and detect misinformation. Uh, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the work on uh, understanding the spread. And I thought that I should tell you a little bit about our own case study uh, as an example of that. So uh, 
back in August 2014, um, there was an article posted on a website that I now know is referred to as an alt-right website. I didn't even know that word uh, back then. And uh, they took a sentence out of the NSF abstract for one of our grants, and uh, and then they uh, uh, and then they wrote an article in which they kind of suggested that we that this research project was about uh, political action, that we were somehow uh, um, targeting conservative accounts or or using the excuse of uh, wanting to detect hate speech, which by the way was nowhere part of what we had proposed to do in our project, um, at, you know, as a way to, to do politics, basically, with federal funds. So unfortunately, this spread fast among other websites and, and Twitter, and then it was picked up um, within a few days. Uh, Fox News, they didn't invite us to ask us any question, they, but they did put my picture there. I'm the big bad guy. And, <laughs> And, uh, and basically, they basically said, you know, this is a 1984 scenario where where the, the government is is manipulating social media to um, you know to to monitor our 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 conversations, and uh, it was debunked very very quickly by reputable news sources like uh, Columbia Journalism Report and and others. But in spite of that, it went viral. It was all over Twitter. There were all kinds of interesting things there. Um, basically, the interpretation was that we were tracking hate speech. This is a thing that from the article. Uh, and therefore, we were somehow targeting conservatives or attacking conservatives. And uh, the, after a while, it kind of looks like it was dying down. But then there was an op-ed by Ajit Pai, who's a member of the FCC, on the, and it was published on the uh, Washington Post. So that ignited a new wave of, of outrage. And if you read this article, it was very careful. It didn't say that we were doing anything. It was just saying, so what if people are doing this? But if you read it, you would think that we were doing this. <laughs> And so that uh, got the attention of uh, the chair of the science uh, committee at, in the House, who wrote about it. There was some more debunking and fact checking. But in spite of that, it was picked up by other politicians. It was pushed by some media. We were, again, on Facebook, on Fox News several times. And uh, the, the narrative changed a little bit after this op-ed. It, the, 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 the narrative started to be that we were somehow, this was an anti-free speech project, that the project was somehow a way to, to attack free speech somehow, um, because that's, that was the argument that was made in that op-ed. There was more uh, fact-checking by science, by the major computing organization, and debugging. In spite of that, uh, the uh, chairman of the... Uh, science committee launched a, or announced that they would launch a formal investigation. Um, we didn't hear anything about this. The elections happened, and then the whole thing died down immediately <laughs> after that. Uh, but we got several FOIA, so our administrators, our legal office, our researchers, everybody had to spend a lot of time showing that these things were just fabricated. And, and in spite of that, the Twitter storm continued. Uh, the, the, the narrative changed again a little bit. Uh, and then this, there was a spin-off of the story that started to say that we were suspending conservative accounts. Of course, we were doing nothing of the sort. But, uh, but that's, somebody said it. So it was out there. And so we were targeting conservatives for suspension. And, um, and, and that was another big uh, thread in the story. OK, this is a slight side uh, story, but I think it's kind of entertaining. So please bear with me. So some of you may know National Report. It's a known fake news website. So they're not even a political website. They are just a fake news website. They make money by people who click on completely fabricated story. And so they, a couple of days after this stuff was uh, trending, they made their own version of it, in which they, they had even a journalist called Ashley Downs Cox who 
according to the biography, graduated at Google University. It was, it actually, it's humorous. Um, and they said, yes, we're building a database to track conservatives, and not only that, but we're tracking when people are sharing memes like pictures with text, and we're reporting to the FBI. And there was an interview with a fake FBI agent who said, yes, we're working with Indiana University to build a database <laughs> of memes, and if you track, if you share a meme on Facebook and Twitter, we, the FBI, are building a file on you. So this was picked up by other fake news websites uh, a long time after that. So this was in September 2014. This was March 2016. And the thread there was FBI creates database listing people who create anti-government memes. And that was picked up by a bunch of these alt-right uh, sites like uh, RBN, and from there it was picked up by the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a Russian blog that basically says the U.S. authorities had decided to spy on internet memes, and then from there it went to Russian uh, propaganda sites. Uh, so this is Russia Today. It's huge. It's like the largest Russian news organization. And you can, this is on the Spanish ver, uh, version of the website. You could, if you speak Spanish, you can read it for yourself. And it went to Sputnik, which is, which is another sort of slightly underground propaganda machine. And uh, then that went in South America. This is a Korean version in which they say that we have $100 million from the federal government. Where are we putting this money? <laughs> Uh, okay, so so this is this is just one example, right? Stuff, fake stuff for political reasons that goes into fake stuff for entertaining or for click reason, and then that goes into more political stuff. It can become an international conspiracy theory. Uh, we'll try to look a little bit about who was spreading this particular meme because we were interested in it. And uh, if you look at all these accounts that were propagating this stuff. Uh, then we sort of map them on the, to the Twitter sphere of people talking about politics in the US. And unsurprisingly, this all came from one particular group. Uh, of, of, and so that sort of uh, leads to this idea of echo chambers that, that we hear uh, about all the time. So I'll say a little bit more about, about echo chambers. So this is a picture that uh, shows the two major echo chambers, left-leaning and right-leaning, uh, among people who talk about politics in the in the U.S. and our one of our questions is what is the role of online social networks and social media in fostering echo chambers, filter bubbles, segregation, and polarization? So are social media just reflecting the segregation that already exists among us, or are they actually making things worse? That's a, actually a hard question to 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 explore. So for example, one, one angle of this is to look at whether if you access and click on links to uh, articles or news or websites coming from, let's say, a search engine versus coming from your email versus coming from a social media, uh, which of these leads you to having a more homogeneous view? For example, which of these lends you on a smaller set of websites more frequently as opposed to sending your traffic to lots of different websites. And so when we measure, for example, using entropy, this kind of homogeneity, we see that, uh, for example, social media have a much lower entropy than search, meaning that you're more likely to visit uh, a smaller set of websites when you're clicking on things that come from your social media uh, 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 th thread or screen versus when you're clicking on, let's say, search engine results. But not all social media are the same. Uh, it turns out that if you look at traffic from different uh, websites, you find uh, different different results. So some of them have much higher homogeneity bias, and some of them have much lower homogeneity bias. Uh, so uh, so that's something that is still work in progress, but. Uh, it points to the fact that technology is not neutral, right? Technology is not, it, it may be designed to be neutral, but in the end, if you consider how people use the technology, it may have an effect on what information you're exposed to. 
Turns out that if you just look at the structure of these networks of political conversation, you can very easily guess whether somebody is, is conservative or liberal just by looking at their friends. This is not surprising, but it tells you how, how these clusters are sort of revealing about political opinions. And we've looked at the we've looked at the structure of the two parts of the network, the conservative and the liberal, some time back. And they both have they both are very, very dense. They have very deep cores, that is, sub uh, networks where basically everybody is connected to everybody else, which makes it extremely efficient for information to travel inside the echo chamber. But it is also makes it hard for information to go outside of the echo chamber. So these echo chambers work in terms of spreading stuff very fast inside, but they also kind of trap the information. Uh, and this is true for both of them, although there are some differences between the two that I won't go into. So again, does do social media make things worse in terms of facilitating the creation of these echo chambers? So one of the ways that we're trying to answer this question is with some models. Okay, so we built some agent-based models where people, you know, look through their screens and click on thing, click on things, and they may have some more or less attention or things that they remember or things that they look at. And this is work that we're doing also with um, uh, that we've been working on with uh, Diego Fregolente, who's here, and uh, and then we try to. Uh, see the predictions of these models uh, and compare them with empirical data and see if this model tells us something about uh, the mechanisms that lead to this phenomena. So for example, one that we're studying with some collaborations at, as collaborators at the University of uh, Torino is the role of community structure again. So if we assume that some information is spread by a group and then this group is more or less mixed with the rest of the network or more isolated, what effect does that have on the information from this group reaching uh, a larger fraction of the network? And it turns out that, uh, in fact, uh, these models suggest that the more segregated the, the, the group of gullible people who are more likely to retweet misinformation, the, more, uh, the higher the number of believers of those that adopt these memes of misinformation and, and spread them. So, the community structure may have an effect, and guess what? It's really easy for us to change the structure of our social network. All you have to do is unfollow somebody who posts something that you don't like, right? Um, we also looked at the effect of limited attention. So if you can only pay attention to a small number of things, does that help you interpret what, what we observe, what goes viral? And of course, we have these typical signatures of virality where some things are, are uh, uh, are retweeted by a lot of people or movies are seen by a lot of people and some users who have a very large number of followers and friends. And so can we interpret these kinds of dynamics? And whoops, what, did I go backwards? Sorry. So it turns out that these models help us um, understand the effect of uh, the net, not only of the structure of the network, like I mentioned, but also of the finite attention of the users. So uh, without going into the details, but basically what these pictures are showing is that if you have a network that it has the typical structure of the social network with its clustering coefficient and hubs and so on, and if you have agents where you assume that they can only remember a limited amount of information, they can't pay attention to everything, they can only pay attention to some things that they see on their screen, then you get these distribution of popularity so that some memes will go viral and the majority will not. And this is completely independent of the value of these memes because in this model, a meme is nothing, it's just a number. They don't have fitness, they don't have quality, they don't have reliability. So you basically cannot escape the fact of having these viral things except that they don't have to have anything to do with quality. So you may have two things that are perfectly equivalent and one of them goes super viral and the other one does not. And this is just explained by the structure of the network and the limited attention of the agents. So you don't need a more complicated explanation based on quality. That helps us understand why there is so much junk that goes viral. And to further explore that, we are again with Diego doing um, a little bit of work on a model where we now also assume that memes have fitness, they have quality. And we assume that if you see two pieces of information and one is more interesting or more reliable 
or better written than the other, then you're more likely to share it. And so in this, in this scenario, in this market of ideas, do the best ideas win, okay? And it turns out, it turns out that it depends a lot on, param on a couple of parameters on the model. One is how much competition there is. Like if there's some amount of new stuff that goes into the system, right? People tweet new things, uh, uh, junk websites generating more content because they want you to click and, and they get money from the ads. So we're bombarded from this information. So we have a parameter that accounts for how much information uh, competes for our attention, this information overload. And that's a very important parameter. And it turns out that if you ha at one extreme, you have very weak competition, so there is less stuff competing for attention, and then you can have sort of a highly efficient market. Efficiency here means the capability of the best memes to become preponderant in the network, which is, uh, which is uh, here in this picture is the size of the, of the node, right? Bigger node means a person who has adopted a high quality meme. But there's very little uh, diversity. At the other extreme, if you have a lot of information that competes for your attention, okay, it's nice that you have diversity, but on average, the efficiency is very low. You have a lot of junk. Um, so between these two extremes, there is some kind of trade-off, and that trade-off is affected by another important parameter, which is how much attention you can, how many things you can pay attention to. And if you can pay attention to lots of things, like in the limit here, then there is a good trade-off where you could say, okay, maybe I can have a system where I have good diversity, but, but the best things win. And so how do you validate that against empirical data? So we looked at the empirical data to try and get a gauge for the amount of attention for how many things people see when you're scrolling through your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, how many things do you click on or how long do you stay on before you decide what to, re for what to reshare, for example. Um, and also on sort of the amount of new stuff that goes into the system. These are things that we can more or less measure. And the sad news uh, is that even though, like I said, in theory, there is this very good trade-off, in, um, in practice, we are in a regime uh, of very low efficiency, or at least the model predicts that because of the limited amount of attention that we have, that's uh, this line here, and the amount of uh, new stuff that goes into the system, um, you expect very, very low efficiency in the system. And so that helps us interpret the empirical observation that there is so much misinformation that goes viral. We're just bombarded with so much stuff. We may click on something before we realize maybe two steps below, we would have seen another post that says, oh, that was a hoax. Too late. We already clicked on it. Our 100 or 500 friends have already seen it. And so it keeps going, right? So finally, uh, just a few minutes about things that we think perhaps could be done to mitigate the spread of misinformation. And uh, so I, I, I mentioned that one of the interesting questions is how misinformation spreads. Is it, is it the case that all the people who believe in conspiracy theories are just in their own isolated you know, group or island? Or is it the case that they are spread over, over the population? So we're trying to build a system. We call it Hoaxy. Uh, we hope to be able to release it quite soon, where we are trying to allow people to visualize the spread of fake news. So in this case, we just go to websites that are known to only publish fake news, fabricated news. And um, sadly, there is many of them. But from a research perspective, we have plenty of data. <laughs> And then we look at all the fake news, and we look at the URLs, and we look at how people are sharing the URLs, the links to this fake news on Twitter. And we could track them. And we could also track people who share um, checks or fact checking about those fake news, like a link to a Snop article that says that that particular article is, is fake, that claim is uh, untrue. So hopefully by doing this, we'll be able to compare sort of the dynamics or the competition uh, between in the spread of information and misinformation um, online. So hopefully that will generate some good data that uh, people can use. I'm going to skip this because I'm running a little bit late. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, one last thing that we're trying to do is see if we could use uh, network uh, science methods to begin to attack the problem of fact-checking, okay? So, so, so we have uh, 
knowledge networks, for example, extracted from Wikipedia, uh, things like Freebase, DBpedia, and so on. And they connect entities, concepts, uh, in, a, in a relational sense. So we have these networks. And so now let's assume that you have a piece of information that is, for example, Sylvester wants to eat Tweety, okay? So this is a triple. It has an entity, Sylvester, wants to eat a relation, and Tweety, another entity, okay? So maybe these two entities are in the network, okay? And now we want to see whether the network tells us something about the likelihood of this statement. And so we could look for paths in the actual network between these two concepts. And this is one possible path. Okay, Sylvester is a cat, cats are carnivorous, carnivorous animals eat birds, and Tweety is a bird, and that's a path. Is it good, is it bad? But maybe there are many other paths. So here's another example. Sylvester is an animal and Tweety is an animal. Well, intuitively, the one on top gives you more information because the one at the bottom, uh, it looks short, it only has two steps, but it goes through a very, very generic concept, right? There are millions of concepts that are connected to animals. And so um, one, just to give you one intuition that we're following, is that we could perhaps measure the distance between concepts, so the semantic distance or similarity between concepts, by paying attention to the generality of the nodes along the path, with the intuition that more specific concepts may be more informative. And that's one thing that we are exploring. Then you can also look at whether the relations along the path match or are related to the relation in the, in the statement that you want to verify. For example, here it says want to eat, and probably eat here is more similar to want to eat than the other relations is A, for example, that we have in, this, in, the, in these paths. And so hopefully if you go through relations that are more similar to the target relation, perhaps that might give you a more reliable path. And now you could see whether there are paths that somehow look like or are similar or are related to the target statement. And maybe that can help fact checkers quickly find some related information. And uh, so that's something that we're exploring. So if you test this on very, very, very simple cases where there is very simple statements that are easy to check, for example, relationships between presidents and, and uh, their spouses. Uh, so then here, uh, you can put them on a matrix. So the stuff on the diagonal is true. Uh, for example, you know, uh, Michelle Obama is, uh, uh, spouse of Barack Obama, and then off diagonal here, you have things that are not true. For example, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy is the spouse of Barack Obama. And then uh, the color on this matrix represents the score that we get from our algorithm based on these uh, path lengths in the DBpedia network. And in general, it turns out that things that are on the diagonal that are true tend to have a higher value uh, than the things that are off diagonal. It's, it's far from perfect. It's very, very, very preliminary, but it gives us some hope that maybe these kind of approaches could be useful at some point in the future to help fact checkers. Yes. Uh, because when you go and look at the Wikipedia, you found that she was actually very influential and that uh, there are articles in Wikipedia that talk about things that she started and initiatives and centers and funds and things where the Carter administration was also built upon them and supported them. And so there are relations in the database connecting those two individuals. So again, it's not foolproof. It's very sort of, think of it as a proof of concept. Here's another example where we're looking at capitals of states. And again, the stuff along the diagonal, which are the true things, you could see they're a little bit more more, uh, the, the score is a little bit higher than the things of um, diagonal, which are the false statements. So now we're trying to see, you know, can we improve it? Can this actually be useful? And it's very, it's very early stages of research. But if something like this one day could work, then ideally would be like, could we automatically extract things to be checked from social media? And maybe we see a pattern that is very common. We feed it into the network, we look for the path, and then we have, can reach some conclusion about whether there is support for this statement or not. In this case, there is a very long path connecting those two statements, um, on those two, uh, sorry, entities on, on Twitter. Okay, so to finish up, just summarizing a few things. 
uh, we've seen that the structural, temporal content and user features can be used to detect AstroTurf and social bots and campaigns on social media. And we've seen that we are exposed to, but we also spread uh, misinformation. Uh, and this happens through our biases, both in social media and traditional media. And those biases represent themselves, for example, in our echo chambers. And uh, social network structure, limited attention, and information overload may be ingredients that help us understand what makes us more vulnerable to misinformation. And so maybe you should think twice before you unfollow your cousin who makes a post that you really don't like. And finally, maybe, maybe, maybe we begin to have a little bit of progress towards building some tools that help us uh, either do fact checking or at least understand the competition between misinformation and fact checking. Uh, let me again say that this work is uh, done by a lot of great uh, students and colleagues and postdocs in our lab. And so uh, thanks to them and also to the to our funding uh, sources. And thank you guys for coming. And I hope there is some time for questions. Yes, Jared, another alum, alum from Indiana University. Very good question. I'll repeat it for the mic. Uh, have we seen differences between uh, fake news websites that are deliberately trying to spread misinformation and uh, websites like uh, The Onion that are that are spreading uh, uh, funny funny things? And what's the word? Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Satire. Satire. I think that's the official. Yeah, the, the official word that they use is satire website. And in fact, there are we have both of those categories uh, that we hope to track with Ho Hoxi. We that system is still being put in place, so I don't have a good answer for you. But we would like to see to study that difference. So in our database, we're we're trying to label a URL whether it comes from a fake news website, or a fact-checking website, or a satire website. And that's very interesting because I could see myself retweeting something from the Onion. Uh, not because I want to spread misinformation, but because I think it's funny, and I'm assuming that most people who will read it will see that it is uh, funny, and that's how it is intended. But we've also seen examples where that doesn't happen, uh, where, where, where things that are supposed to be funny, then uh, people believe them, and, and they become conspiracies. So that's a very good question, and uh, we would like to look at that, but we're not there yet. Yes. Uh, that software. Um, some of that are Yes. Right. So, what do you think the limit is on increasing our attention based on how we design either a really hard limit on how many people watch this process, or could we increase the quality of the Uh, very good question. I'll repeat. I'll try to repeat it again. So, uh, since we've, we're beginning to see how our use of technology, for example, social media versus search engines, seem to affect, um, seems to have an effect on the likelihood that misinformation spreads. Uh, is it the case that perhaps we can design our platforms in a way that makes that better, or is it really impossible because you know this is this is our limits of our brain, and so we can't really solve this by design. Again, this is a very good question. I don't think we have a good solution, but certainly I think we would have been, we would not have been able to predict some years ago that building an interface where it's really easy to scroll and it's really easy to look at lots of things and you're more likely to see things from your friends and you're more likely to see things from sources that you like and that you've clicked on before. I mean, these are all really common sense things that social media platforms are doing for us. And you would think that they would lead to pretty good pattern of information exploration. But it turns out that that's not the case. 
So maybe in our quest to create, uh, to design interfaces that are easy to navigate, that expose a lot of information, that expose us to information that is familiar, we've, you know, we've achieved the op perhaps we've achieved exactly what we wanted to achieve, which is for the social media sites to get a lot of clicks and to make money from advertising because they keep us engaged by finding things that we like. And therefore, the more time we stay on the site, the more likely we are to click on an ad. So maybe they achieve that goal, but they don't achieve the goal of um, keeping us better informed. Uh, we, uh, I was just talking uh, earlier today in, in one of my conversations about this apparently uh, contradictory thing. We, we assume that social media, because anybody could share anything, we would be exposed to everything, including reliable information. It would be out there. So that's a more open market, a market with more participants. You think it is a more uh, efficient market? And so we would access to better information wherever it came from. We're free from the slavery of these few gatekeepers. Well, that turns out to be not true. So I really don't know what to predict. Uh, will, you know, is it the case that we can design our way out of it? I'm a little skeptical about that, um, but I don't know. A little bit of that was you had one diagram where you showed, sort of showed a sweet spot where the information why can't you design an app that fills out that sweet spot? So that sweet spot, I'll, I'll go back to the, to the slide, was based on a model in which we assumed, I don't know what I did. OK. Uh, back very slowly. That sweet spot was based on a model that assumed that we could be very careful in deciding what we share before we share it. So we would be able to look at 50 things and then say, okay, now that I've looked at 50 things, I'm gonna share one or two or three, whatever, but I'm gonna share the things that are probably the best ones. Well, guess what? Nobody looks at 50 things. We look at three, five, 10. If you look at the distribution, it's the classic uh, you know, power law where occasionally people look at lots of things, but usually they look at very few. Is that a, 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 a something that you can solve by design, or is it an intrinsic limit of our busy life? And then together with the fact that there is a lot of competition. And so can we control that with, a, with, a, um, with an interface? I mean, the naive thing could be to say, OK, since there is a lot of junk, I'm going to make an algorithm that is even more selective that shows you even fewer things that are the things that you really, really always look at. And so I'm pretty sure that those are the best things for you. Well, that probably would have the opposite effect. It would create even tighter echo chambers where we would see even fewer sources. So I, I don't think it's an easy problem to solve. I, I really don't know. Um, and I hope that research will give us some intuition. But at this point, I don't know that we have good answers. people are using this is like let's say somebody's interested in the impact of these anti-vax people on vaccination um, good is there, question is there any way you can measure the actual impact of these misinformation or I'm, I'm happy you asked that. Uh, yeah, so in fact, that is one of the things that we would like to look at. And in particular, in the case of vaccinations, we, I have a student who is just now beginning to look at this problem. Um, there, are, there are people who have looked at, um, for example, interactions between the spread of some information that affects behavior, and then that behavior may affect uh, some epidemic. So in this case, you might say that the spread of misinformation about vaccines might make us more vulnerable, might change the R0. Let's say if you have a standard SIR model of diffusion of uh, epidemic model, and then that might generate bigger cascades or bigger outbreaks. And, uh, but there is there is some work in that direction, but it's still very limited. And it doesn't look at factors like the cluster, the echo chambers, the clustering of the, of the information diffusion network, and also the geography. Like, uh, you know, the network of contact, the physical contact network has a very different structure than, than the social information diffusion network. And so we're beginning to look at what the idea is to look at the interactions between these two diff very different kinds of networks and then understand whether factors about the spread of misinformation 
could make it more or less likely for a certain group of people in a geographically uh, local area uh, to, to have some kind of critical mass. For example, number of vaccinations goes down enough that you have a higher likelihood of an outbreak. So that's uh, one, one thing that we would like to look at, whether we'll be successful or we'll find interesting things or not, I don't know. But I think it's a very good question. And there was a question from the back, yes. Yes, uh, this is a very important observation that, and this problem is very well studied. It, 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 it goes by many names, confirmation bias, selective exposure, and so on. So we typically, we know from psychology and from sociology that people are more likely to pay attention to things that um, agree or confirm their existing beliefs. And that's one of the criteria that lead to these echo chambers. You simply are uh, selecting sources that are likely to confirm your, your beliefs. So if you're a liberal, you're more likely to select sources that support liberal views. If you're a conservative, you're more likely to select sources that confirm your conservative views. And the, so we know that that exists, and that has always existed. It's much harder for us to believe something that forces us to change our belief system, to re-examine a lot of our beliefs, and so we, we tend to forget them more easily, we tend to overlook them more easily. We, we have, there's a lot of uh, experimental support for this. Uh, the question, is how do social media play in this equation? For example, by making it more easy, like in the example that I mentioned before, um, uh, uh, my wife this morning uh, posted something uh, humorous on Facebook. It was a, one of these memes, these pictures uh, that says, that has a picture of two men kissing and then says, if you share this on social media, then a homophobic person will unfollow you. But that's exactly, I don't think it's so funny because it, 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 it's funny, but it's not funny. It, it, it shows how, how the, the network itself makes it uh, easy for us to, follow homo to form homogeneous groups. And while that may be good for us, it makes us feel good because we're exposed to things that we agree on, um, it makes it much more easy to form these echo chambers and to shield us from different perspectives. And uh, so the question is, does technology amplify those effects? It, does it make it more easily for us to be biased by, uh, by confirmation bias, by homogeneity, by uh, crowd effects, by following popular opinion that we think is popular, but it's really only popular among a subset? And so all of these are very, very good questions that it would be nice to study. And my guess is that technology is not neutral in the sense that it actually facilitates. These are normal bias. By the way, I should say that these are good things for us, right? They have developed over evolution because they're good for us. Uh, if we see that everybody starts running out the door, I probably start running out the door because I'm gonna assume that people are not crazy and there is a good reason. Right, and so that's our natural tendency to follow the majority. To and normally that's good. That that saves zebra from being all eaten by the lions, right? But in now we're applying those same uh, principles that have been good for our survival in our brain to a new environment where I might get a signal that I should start running because I see it on Facebook, but really. That person running is in Australia, so I shouldn't really have started running because it doesn't really affect me. So the social network is shrinking distances and altering the balance of those uh, rules that our brain has evolved. And so I think this is something that we haven't quite yet understood very well. And with that, let's thank Dr. Okay. Dr. again. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you.